In 2021, physics has never been more important in addressing the big global challenges we all face today. Now, APS members from academia, national laboratories and industry are gathering virtually for the 2021 APS March meeting to communicate and explore these challenges together. And we're here to cover it all. This is APS TV. Hello and welcome to the third episode of APS TV, brought to you from the virtual 2021 APS March meeting. Now we're getting the hang of it, aren't we? And today we have even more cutting edge physics and the latest APS news for you. We'll be featuring some of the very best research in physics today from across the world. And we'll be hearing about machine learning from the Kavli Symposium. <laughs> might sound like a bit boring of an answer, Stephen, but I think it means we continue to work uh, to advance our policy priorities for the physics community. So my lecture is about uh, how quantum matter research is getting reshaped by data revolution. Absolutely delighted now to be joined by Mark Elsesser, who, as you know, is Director of uh, Government Affairs with the uh, APS. Mark, first of all, welcome. Ah, thanks for having me, Stephen. Government Affairs, interesting uh, times. You've got a new president, new administration. What, what, what does that mean for the APS and for you in Government Affairs? It might sound like a bit boring of an answer, Stephen, but I think it means we continue to work uh, to advance our policy priorities for the physics community and the scientific enterprise overall. You know, we see several areas where our priorities overlap with the priorities of the Biden administration. Um, they've extended the New START Treaty, which is a nuclear weapons treaty with Russia. Uh, they've ended a ban on diversity trainings in the federal government, and we are strongly supportive of, of both of those things. Uh, in terms of Congress, um, I think historically, you know, you can see that there's a bipartisan support for science there, and I don't think that that's changing. So what are, what are your top priorities? One, as always, is federal R&D budgets. We're looking for immediate research relief, as well as robust increases for the science agencies and the appropriations process. Uh, next priority really is ending sexual harassment in STEM. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We continue to work to address the liquid helium crisis. Uh, as you probably know, our members uh, see dramatic price increases in helium year over year. Yeah, one of your greatest strengths at the APS, obviously, is your membership. And how can the members get involved with, with, with your work? So the easiest and quickest way for our members to get involved is through our what we call our Action Center. And this can be ac accessed from the Policy and Advocacy tab if you go to APS.org. And then for people who want to go a step further uh, than, you know, calls, tweets, uh, letters, uh, we strategically engage members who are in districts or states, you know, of members who are on key committees that we want to influence. And we'll do things like partner with those folks on op-eds or set up, you know, either in-person or virtual visits for them to meet with staff and discuss issues. Well, thanks ever so much indeed for uh, joining us today. We've really appreciated catching up with you and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Appreciate it. And now a look at physicists researching materials at extreme conditions at the Institute for Shock Physics at Washington State University. The Institute for Shock Physics at Washington State University is a multidisciplinary research organization with the primary motivation of doing experimental research and analysis on understanding how materials behave under extreme thermodynamic conditions. What is unique about the shock physics program here, or research program here, is it's extremely broad. We do physics, we do chemistry, we do mechanical engineering, we do material science, we do geoplanetary science. There is no other program that even comes close. And students from different departments come and do their research here. And they come and study the how materials of interest to them in these different fields behave when they're subjected to very high pressure shock waves. The Duke University Medical Physics Graduate Program explores four pillars of medical physics. 
diagnostic imaging, health physics, nuclear medicine and radiation oncology. The programme emphasises rigorous, exciting and practical research that makes a difference in healthcare. The Duke Medical Physics Graduate Program strives to produce outstanding medical physicists, both in clinic and research, who will go on to become leaders in the field. We aim to give our students training in the technical aspects, the didactic training, as well as hands-on practicum training. The Duke Medical Physics program is founded in the four traditional tracks of medical physics. We have diagnostic imaging, we have radiation therapy, we have health physics, and we have nuclear medicine. Medical physics is the application of physics in medicine. Uh, the idea is that what happens in the patients and what happens, happens in the technologies that we use to care for the patient is founded on physics principles. So we can know those principles, we can exploit those principles, we can utilize those principles to advance healthcare and the way we care for our patients. The Crocker Nuclear Laboratory Cyclotron has been operating for over 50 years, but it's still finding useful and exciting applications in the 21st century. In addition to the historical commitment to the treatment of uveal cancer in the eye and studying radiation effects on electronics, scientists have recently started new initiatives in isotope production, environmental studies and accelerator instrumentation. We continue to innovate. We continue to come up with new methods and new techniques to understand our environment and our world at greater detail. Whether it be nuclear physics or instrumentation development or novel atomic physics, uh, and in particular we're interested in the educational opportunities for students and also forming partnerships in training people to use a cyclotron that would be applicable to other facilities. I'm a chemical engineer, but our lab group is mostly composed of biomedical engineers, but it's a very good collaboration between um, the engineering departments and the Department of Physics here at, at UC Davis. We're excited about a number of things, and we would like to get the word out that we are available. There's so much to engage with at the APS March meeting, and APS TV is bringing you all the very latest physics news and highlights from the meeting, from labs, universities, and corporations across the globe. And here's how to watch on the front page of the virtual meeting platform on a dedicated page at the APS website and on our YouTube channel and Twitter. Now to Japan and the University of Tsukuba's Plasma Research Center. Researchers there are using the world's largest tandem mirror device, Gamma 10 PDX, to study plasma physics and fusion science. For the future demonstration reactor demo, it's necessary to qualify material concepts already today. Using the world's largest standard mirror machine gamma 10, we have achieved high ion temperatures comparable to fusion plasma. The goal of the Centre for Bright Beams at Cornell University is to enhance the capabilities of particle beams in order to increase the reach of scientific research and to make high quality beams more accessible to research institutions, medical facilities and industry. 
The Center for Bright Beams is a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center. We get a large group of people together to work around one big idea. And in our case, the big idea is increasing the brightness of electron beams. It turns out the world's brightest beams are made by the photoelectric effect. So one of the things we're trying to do is understand photo emission. How does it really work? How can we design a photocathode that gives the brightest possible beam? And we're looking at new technologies that will enable the use of very high power beams in normal settings, not just at a national lab or a very large facility, but really made accessible. The Center for Bright Beams has brought together this very dynamic group that is pooling their expertise in order to increase the brightness of electron beams. Time to take an inside look at the work of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, advancing new theoretical approaches to quantum matter and seeking to guide the discovery of new quantum phases. The theory of quantum matter unit is also harnessing the power of machine learning to address highly complex problems in theoretical physics. The theory of quantum matter unit is about bringing very smart young people together with interesting ideas and giving them the space to create something new. And you can think of what we do as something like the social life of electrons. OIST has a unique mission. Uh, one part of that is to foster the economic development of Okinawa. What we tried to do as scientists regularly was to interact with the community, in particular with very young kids, to show them uh, science, to try to make them interested into science. These are the kind of cool stuff that we can do together. Machine learning is also the subject of this year's Kavli Symposium at APS. Un R. Kim from Cornell University is discussing machine learning and quantum emergence. So my lecture is about uh, how quantum matter research is getting reshaped by data revolution and how we can um, harness this data revolution to get to new discoveries and make dramatic progress using machine learning. Seeking scientific understanding is about trying to find the mapping between data and theory. It becomes natural to see that as the data space become larger, more complex, it would be beneficial to make use of machine learning tools and data science tools that are designed to be able to find uh, complex functions in large dimensional space. So your choice of tool should be guided by the data problem, it should be objective uh, driven. So first know your data problem and then try to find a tool that would work, serve your, your goal the best. So historically, uh, programming a machine first started with a very practical goal of trying to design mass-produced textile that was the uh, punch card loom. And that was just the beginning of programming a machine. It was a small start, but that led to where we are today. I want to advocate for the need to uh, learn to use tools so that we can program automated processes so that our energy can be uh, spared for uh, creativity and discovery and uh, understanding. Ultimately, understanding comes back to the scientists and uh, that's where we can have a lot of fun. And now UCLA's Center for Quantum Science and Engineering is a new interdisciplinary center located in the heart of Southern California's burgeoning quantum science industry. 
Demand for skilled researchers in the area has exploded, with companies such as HRL Labs, Google and IBM expanding their interest in quantum computing, communication and sensing. And this centre meets their needs. Interest in quantum science and technology has just exploded over the last several years. There are now major efforts at big companies like Microsoft and IBM and Google. There are efforts at smaller companies like HRL Laboratories, IonQ, Brigetti. So the landscape has changed dramatically and along with that change in the landscape has been a need for people to enter the workforce in this area. Next up, CTQMAT is a research association between the JMU Würzburg, the TU Dresden and five other renowned institutions, which concentrates on the development and understanding of novel quantum materials. In the cluster, we explore the role of topological physics in diverse types of uh, quantum materials from electronic materials to synthetic photonic matter. Another aspect is complexity, that is the interplay of topology and many-body interactions. to have a much more complete understanding of the systematics of interacting topological matter. We will have discovered and synthesized many new topological materials and we will have identified a number of promising applications, be it in electronics or photonics. And finally, the Inter-University Accelerator Centre is the first inter-university centre in India to provide front-ranking, accelerator-based experimental facilities for research for university users. Inter-University Accelerator Centre is a novel concept for equitable distribution and optimal utilization of resources in the country, especially in the area of accelerator-related physics. This idea of having Inter-University Accelerator Centre here in Delhi, it caters to the needs of all the researchers in the country. Research carried out at Inter-University Accelerator Centre are primarily in the areas of nuclear science, material science, atomic and molecular physics, radiation biology, geochronology, and other allied areas where the accelerators are needed. We do carry out experiments for single event upset for all the payloads through satellite in the space. And also, we are going to add free electron lasers. We would like to identify the satellite centers in universities to augment, to supplement, and sometimes to complement the facilities which we have here in IUSC New Delhi. So that's it for now from our third show from the virtual 2021 APS March meeting, but we've even more lined up for you tomorrow. Join us as we look into photonics and iron beam analysis, as well as astrophysics. See you then.